All right, this is called polynomial behavior. Actually, well, it is. It's poly, well, it's called function behavior, but it's also mostly polynomial behavior. But this, this is a weird function that looks like it's probably a piecewise defined function because it's definitely in pieces. All right, behavior. We're going to be looking at the behavior of functions and in particular polynomial functions today. Okay, this function has definite starting and stopping points. Notice there are solid circles here. There's only one open circle. So let's go ahead and code these. Now let's see, what was my code from yesterday? Green was increasing. Oh, oh. Increasing. Red was decreasing. And blue was constant. Okay, so let us take a look at this. For instance, this part of the graph is constant. And this part of the graph goes from negative nine on the x-axis to, see, negative eight, negative seven, negative six, negative five. Although for the blue part, negative five is open. So notice that if we're looking at the first two questions, domain and range, then what we have here is we would have a bracket and then we would have an open negative five. Because X actually equals negative nine but X does not equal negative five. And these points are negative nine, negative six, and negative five, what would be negative five and negative six, but really isn't quite. It's still what the point is though. And so this is our interval right here. Right now, I'm just kind of breaking things down. Okay, we have an increasing line right here. Remember, we're going from left to right. Left. I don't want to write that in red, though, because this is true for the whole thing. left all the way to right. That's the way we read it. Okay, now, so the increasing part well, there are two parts, aren't there, that are increasing. Okay. 
So I'm just kind of coloring them in early. OK, and this part over here is also increasing. As you look from left to right. So let's see. Here we have a negative five that really does exist. So this point is actually going to color in the negative five. And this is going to increase until we get to negative five, negative four, negative three, negative two. See if you come directly down from this point. You're at negative two. OK, now look at this. This was open an open hole, but it got closed in by that. And so this entire. Part of the X axis. Is now. Colored in. That's going to be important when we look at the domain. There wasn't there would have been an open hole there if that had been an open hole, but now there's not. OK, now over here. This is increasing from let's go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, from seven. On the X axis two, eight, nine on the x-axis. And those are solid points. And we have decreasing I like the way that red is so nice and bright. It's easy to see. Okay, and this part is decreasing from negative one all the way to positive seven. And then this is increasing from seven to, and I didn't write it down, nine on the X axis. The X axis tells us where the action is happening. Okay, so now we actually have a solid line starting at negative nine and going to negative two and a solid line starting at negative one on the x-axis and going all the way to positive nine. But there is a break in here, notice that. We've got no part of the graph between negative two and negative one. That's interesting. OK, now to answer what the domain is, the domain is always on the X axis. So watch me here. I am going to take notice that here we have the X axis solidly colored in from negative nine to negative two.
and we have a gap here. And then we have a solid line from negative one to positive nine. And X actually equals negative one and X actually equals positive seven because these endpoints are colored in. Miss Barbara, so because there's because there's a hole at negative five, negative six, but there is like a but there's not at point negative five, negative four, the domains connect. Yes, because okay. here X does actually equal negative five, so that point gets colored in. So it kind of like takes its place and then it just continues. Okay. Okay. Yes, very good. It does. Very, very good. OK, so and then this part of the X axis is where the graph is. So that's negative one to positive nine. And that's the domain of this weird looking graph. Now, the range. This is a little different critter. So before I go to the range, what I want to do is I want to write down the increasing, decreasing, and constant part. So you can tell the difference between how you write increasing, decreasing, and constant and the domain. The, one of the most important things is that the increasing part of the x-axis, the decreasing part of the x-axis, and the constant part of the x-axis, they're all parts of the domain. Because we say where they occur on the x-axis. So the increasing part goes from, now watch me, I'm going to write only parentheses, negative five to negative two, and then I put a comma and not a U. That's the difference between writing increasing, decreasing, and constant and writing the domain. It's hard to remember. OK, and then we've got this other increasing part. That is, the graph is increasing on this interval. 7 to 9. Now, the graph is decreasing, going down from left to right, on this part of the x-axis, the red part. And I don't have to worry about whether that's a bracket or a parenthesis because increasing, decreasing, and constant are all written with only parentheses. So that's going to be from negative one to positive seven. And it's constant from negative nine to negative five. Notice we always write this left to right, left to right, left to right. So these will all come out being these. Now we talk about the range, because I know you're thinking, but, 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 
it's increasing from negative four to negative seven. Yes, that's going to be part of the range. That's what we're going to talk about now. This part of the graph goes through negative six. So negative six is part of our range. Then there's a gap. And the range picks up. Um, oh, I'm going to use this color. OK, the range picks up here at negative four. And goes solidly up to positive seven. The range is always on the Y axis. OK. Now notice this, that every part of this graph this graph goes from five, well, I'm sorry, from one to five. However, notice that one to five is already colored in by this. So we don't have to mention it again. And this runs from one to seven over here, but notice that that's already colored in from when we said where the range of this was. So these guys are actually included in the range of this. So we're going to have a very unusual looking range. This is one number all by itself. Then there's a gap. Then the range runs from negative four to positive seven. There is some part of the graph continuously going from negative four to positive seven. So there will be a bracket, negative four to positive seven. And that's the range. This is how the domain and the range are different from increasing, decreasing, constant. When you're doing increasing, decreasing, constant, you never use brackets. You never use use. The union symbol. You just don't use it. And that is a toughie to memorize. I had to work really, really hard on it. And if I'm not really careful, I still make mistakes with it. So you be sure to watch this part of the video, even if you don't watch the other parts. This this graph is much more instructional than any other graph we've dealt with about what is domain exactly, what is range exactly, and then this part, of course, is new, but now you can look at it and say, oh, 
that's how increasing, decreasing, and constant are different from the domain and range. Discussion. I know it's hard to understand. I've been there. I'm good. Okay. I'm going to assume everybody's good for now. Yes. And we are going to go on to this. This is a nice continuous graph, no breaks. Goes from way down here at negative infinity all the way up here to positive infinity and it goes all the way from negative infinity on the x-axis that is to the left forever all the way to the right forever to positive infinity so the domain and range here are pretty easy. The domain goes from negative infinity to positive infinity on the x-axis. And the range goes from negative infinity to positive infinity on the y-axis. But now we're going to look at something we haven't really dealt a whole lot with, and now we're officially dealing with it. Namely, let's get the increasing part out of the way. <clears throat> you, when you're doing increasing and decreasing, you have to ignore the arrows. Everything everything is from left to right. So this is going up. Until it gets to this point. Then it's going down. until you get to this point, and then it's going up again. Think of it as a roller coaster that can only go from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. So, we have two greens. And this goes for ever up here. Because when we're doing increasing, decreasing, again, we only look from left to right. And this. There's no way I can get that out to positive infinity, but I'm going to try. <laughs> Need to have my glasses adjusted. Okay. All right, so increasing, decreasing, and um, um, constant, but there isn't any constant interval here. Um, they're all on the x-axis, never on the y-axis, even though it feels like they should be. They're not. So, the end of this, if there is an end, 
is at negative infinity, going from left to right all the way into x equals negative 3. So the increasing increasing part, interval of increase is actually what it's called, but just the increasing part of the graph goes from negative infinity into negative three, all the way to negative three, I should say. All the way to negative three. And is increasing from, here's one on the x-axis. Now the scale is off, notice it goes to negative 14 here, to positive 10 here, negative 50 here, to positive 50 here. So you would have to actually take time to figure out the scale. But anyway, we're going to have to believe them that one is the X coordinate right here. Hard to believe, but let's just take it the way they say it. Negative one. All the way. Out to positive infinity on the X axis. and decreasing goes from negative three to positive one. Make a one like theirs. It's hard to see. There. Okay. So notice that the big change in increasing and decreasing occurs here at this point and here at this point. These two points, this is like a hill and this is like a valley. Now this isn't a high mountain, this is like the high mountain. And this is like the deep valley, an infinitely deep valley. But here's a little hill, maybe a foothill, and here's a little valley before you go on up, continue up the mountain. This is called a relative maximum point. And negative one here, because this is the point negative three, negative one. Negative one is the relative maximum. The relative maximum value. At this relative maximum, the graph changes from increasing to decreasing. 
And here is in this little valley here is the relative minimum point. And the relative minimum or the relative minimum value is negative nine. So you can see this is kind of a vocabulary thing. These are very important. You're going to learn that there's a rule. This, well, you're going to be after after the next thing that we talk about, you're going to be able to look at this graph and say, oh, that's a cubic. Probably a cubic. It has, it goes like this. It rises on the left and continues rising on the right. And it has two turning points, which is one of the collective names for the relative maximum point and the relative minimum point. Because the graph turns from going up to going down at the relative maximum point and from going down to going up at the relative minimum point. In fact, here's part of the secret right here. This is not going to be exactly y equals x to the third, but I don't know what it is. But I know that the highest degree is going to be three. And I know that because rises on the left, rises on the right, and uh, what point was I going to make here? Oh yes, whenever the highest power is three, then the maximum number, the most turning points you can have is one less than three. The maximum number of turning points, you could have less but not more, that's what that means. Okay, also the maximum number of x-intercepts. is the, the same as the highest degree, three. That's the maximum number, the most you can have. Notice that this doesn't actually touch the x-axis. Um, it does touch the x-axis there, so this, it ends up only has one x-intercept. and I lost my red coloring right here if I ever put it in. I certainly should have. 
Now let me save this before it all goes to heck. And this is the beginning of our analysis of polynomials. Increasing, decreasing, not usually constant anywhere, but relative maximum points, relative minimum points. They're also called the turning points, which is where increasing and decreasing change from one to another. And then you've got x-intercepts and y-intercepts in there too. Here's the y-intercept, whatever it is. So yes, this will take some flashcards for sure. And as always, I highly recommend them. Now, let us go to a continuation of function behavior, which is really polynomial behavior. Not edit. Well, but nobody's done it yet, so I can do edit, but I'd rather not. I'm afraid I would do something to mess it up. Okay, now this, a lot of this is review from when you reviewed polynomials at the very beginning of the semester, but now it becomes important. It asks you to determine the leading term, the leading coefficient, and the degree of the polynomial, and then classify it as constant, linear, quadratic, cubic, or quartic. So let's do that. Now is the time when you have to actually know that stuff. Um, here, okay. Okay, the leading term is the highest degree term. That's the same thing as saying the highest power term. Well, that means that negative one half x to the fourth, that's the complete term, and it's the highest degree term, it's four, whereas this term is the, is the first degree term, and this term is zero degree, because constants are always called degree zero. Degree one, degree four. So the highest degree term is negative one half x to the fourth. The leading coefficient is the number in front of the leading term. Negative one half. Now let's see what else we were supposed to write down. Um, the degree of the polynomial. Okay, the degree of the polynomial, 
the highest degree term gives the polynomial, the whole polynomial, its degree. So the degree of the polynomial is four. Four, and that makes the polynomial a quartic. And I'm actually taking the time to write all this stuff down. The polynomial is a quartic because the polynomial is degree four. Now you're going to see in a minute that all this stuff, these facts, end up being very important. Why? For end behavior. Because the polynomial is degree four. OK, so this is stuff we talked about long ago when there were woolly mammoths running around the world, the Earth. Um, it feels like that way back at the beginning of the semester. This was part of, of the review and now we're really needing it. OK. Here's a tricky one. Determine the degree of the polynomial. There now. Move that over a bit. Here we have, here's another problem here. This is number six in your homework. Now it doesn't ask you to expand this. That is, it doesn't ask you to turn all this into separate factors and then multiply it all together and come out with anything. That would be cruel and unusual punishment. But um, what it does say is determine the degree and, and the leading term of the pol following polynomial function. So all we're being asked to find is the degree and the leading term. Well, you can do that given that all of this is going to be multiplied. Two times six, well, let's see. Aha, okay. All right, two times six is 12. The highest degree term from squaring this is going to be x to the 12th. Three times three is nine. The highest degree term from writing this factor out three times and then multiplying them all together is going to be x to the ninth. Oh, 
Oh, I wrote it down wrong. That's right, when I, well, oh God be praised. Okay, yes. This, I kind of hoped it would keep the same numbers. I forgot it changes the numbers. So this answer will not be true for that answer. Okay, now when we multiply all this long thing by all this long thing, eventually we're going to multiply these two things together. We are going to have X to the 12 plus 9, which is going to be X to the 21. So the degree of this polynomial is going to be 21 and the leading term is going to be x to the 21. How do I know that? Because the coefficient is one there, so there's not gonna be some other coefficient there. The leading term is just going to be x to the 21. Whew. Okay. Yes, well, that scared me. Now there's a video to watch with this so you'll understand it and it's important so watch it please. We're going to go on to something easy. One of the very few things in this ending part of um, college algebra, the last five weeks is what we're in now. We're going to go over something that actually ends up being pretty darn easy, and that is the end behavior of polynomials. What is end behavior? This is what end behavior is. Okay. End behavior occurs out here and out here. End behavior. Behavior at the ends, the ends of the universe. And there are only four different kinds of possible end behaviors for any polynomial in the universe. Is that cool? Okay. You'd think there'd be an infinite number of possible end behaviors, but there, there, there just aren't. We're not talking about what goes on in here. That is going to be different for each polynomial. But out here at the ends, they have things in common. So let us talk about what those are. Now, the leading term is the most important part of, of end behavior. It's the leading term that, that causes the end behavior, or at least it tells you what the end behavior is. So, if you have a polynomial, of even degree to the 
So that could be like x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, x to the eighth, and on and on. These are even numbers. Okay, so uh, of even degree and a positive leading coefficient. In other words, the number in front is positive. So you need to have these two things. The highest power of the polynomial has to be even. Two goes into it evenly. And the number in front has to be positive. So positive one, or maybe positive three, or even something really ugly like the square root of two, um, or seven. As long as the number is positive and the degree is even, the number can be anything as long as it's positive, but the degree is even, the end behavior is going to look like this. Okay, let's make a quick X and a Y axis. Okay, way out here, your graph is going to go up to get forever and up forever. Never, never go back down. Never double back down. Only go up forever. And the symbol for that is, as you can see over here, if you looked at C, the symbol for that end behavior is up on the right, up on the left, or up on the left, up on the right. If you have a polynomial of even degree, even degree, like x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, x to the eighth, We'll just leave it there. And the coefficient, the leading coefficient and the leading coefficient is negative. like maybe negative one. So that would just be a negative. Um, how about negative three? Negative the square root of two. Then your graph is going to go down on the left forever and down on the right forever once it gets out and away from the y-axis that is out here and out here. And the symbol for that is this, down on the left, down on the right. Now, that takes care of the even degrees. How about the odd degrees? If you have a polynomial, a 
of odd degree That means two does not go into it evenly. So a polynomial of odd degree would be x to the one, or x to the three, or x to the five, x to the seven, and so on. And the leading coefficient is positive. Then the graph will go <clears throat> down forever on the left and up forever on the right. And the symbol for that is this and this. So that's like this right here. We have in the book f of x equals the square root of 2 times x to the third plus 4x squared minus 5x. That's kind of a weird place for a minus. Minus 5x plus 3. Well, it doesn't matter what kind of number you have in front, except that it's positive. This is the highest degree term, therefore the whole polynomial is of uh, of well it's it's of odd degree it's three it's a cubic whatever it does in the middle when it gets out to the ends it's going to go down forever on the left and up forever on the right so will that it's going to go down forever on the left up forever on the right and D it would be the answer to this. D, right there. And finally, if you have a polynomial of odd degree, but the leading coefficient is negative, you've got that, the opposite of this. If the polynomial is positive, no, no, if the polynomial is of odd degree, and the leading coefficient is negative, like, I don't know if there were a negative sign in front of that, then you would have the exact opposite of this. It would go up on the left forever and down on the right forever. And whatever it's going to do in the middle, it's going to do it. Do doesn't matter because that's not the question right now. The question is what happens out at positive and negative infinity. Okay, so let's take a quick look at 
these. We already looked at that one. Here, we have make it nice and big. Here we have a polynomial of even degree six. That's an even number, two goes into it evenly. And the leading coefficient is negative pi. Doesn't matter if you don't like pi. All that matters is it's a negative number. Then, after I flatten that, so it won't disappear, it's going to go down forever on the left and down forever on the right. Okay. And the next one is the same. All right, how about this? Oh, no, we're going on to something else now. Okay, so we'll just do this. How about this? I'm going to change, change number 10 a little bit. P of X. It's polynomial. Um, is negative 4.9 X to the fifth. O plus X to the seventh plus 0 0.8 X to the ninth. Trick question. Number 10 is a trick question. They have it backwards. Polynomials have to be written in descending order. This is the degree of the polynomial, the highest degree. It's of odd degree, and the number in front of it is positive, so the end behavior is going to go up on the right forever and down on the left forever. So be careful. Okay. Now, this is going to be one of the most important um, lessons you have. We've talked before about what a zero is. The rest of the um, of this homework. Function behavior and zeros is we're going to talk about what a zero is. So we have a function, zeros. See, there are lots of little facts you're going to be learning, and then we're going to put them all together into the rational zeros theorem, which is arguably the most important theorem in all of algebra. In fact, another name for, for that is it's part of the fundamental theorem of algebra. You're going to be learning about it. These are all little parts of it. All right, we have f of x equals x to the third minus 11x squared plus 12x plus 34. And they're asking you to test a number to see if it's a zero of the function. What is a zero of the function? Well, we're going to be testing x equals 3. So that's f of 3. So that'll be 3 to the third 
minus 11 times 3 squared plus 12 times 3 plus 34. That'll be 27. 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. Minus 11 times 9. 3 squared is 9 plus 36 plus 34. This will be 27 minus 99 plus 36 plus 34. Let's see. Okay, so yeah, 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 this is always a problem. Okay, now 27, 27 minus 99 plus 36, plus 34. I'll make it big for you. Enter. Equals negative two. Okay. Miss Barbara, I have a question for you. Uh, where did you get the 27, 27 on the second line? Um, up up here. Three times, isn't three, three times three, three nine? Yes, but this is three to the third power, which is oh, three oh. times three times three. But yeah, it's yeah. so tricky. It is a tricky number. I was like, how did we get that number? But never mind. Thank you, Miss Barbara. You're welcome. All right, the question is, is three a zero of the function? And the answer is no. Three is not a zero of f of x. Well, what the heck is a zero? A zero of a function is a number that makes the function equal zero, which is why it's called a zero. So if the number doesn't make the function equal zero, then, then that number isn't a function. Simple as that. Let's find one that does. Huh, they're giving us all no's. I don't want to know. I want a yes. Here's a yes. Okay. F of X equals X to the fourth minus 6X to the third plus 4X squared minus 7X plus 30. And we are testing the number two. So we're going to have two to the fourth power, two times two times two times two, minus six times two to the third power, 
2 times 2 times 2, plus 4 times 2 squared, minus 7 times 2, I could have put parentheses, plus 30. So let's see. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16, minus 6 times 2 times 2 times 2, that's 8. 6 times 8, plus, 4 times 4 minus 7 times 2 is 14 plus 30. So this is going to be 16 minus 48 plus 4 times 4 is 16, that's a times, minus 14 plus 30. Yucky. Ew. Okay. Well, how about this? 16 minus 48 is 32. Negative 32. Is that right? Yes, it is. All right. Plus 16. That'll be negative 16. Minus 14, that's negative 30. Plus 30 is zero. Yay! So two is a zero of the function. Two is a zero of f of x. Simple as that. And in the last two minutes, we are being asked to find the zeros of some functions, but we will just do that tomorrow because the next homework has it also. We don't have time for these. But I can put it on the video anyway, so I think I will do that. Um, we're going to find the zeros. Of f of x when f of x equals x to the third minus 8x squared minus x plus 8. So that will be x to the third minus 8x squared plus negative x plus 8. And so our GCF will be x squared. So we'll have x squared times x minus 8 plus, now, the GCF has to be negative because the leading coefficient is negative. There. Now I have two negative ones. And negative 1 times negative 8 is positive 8, so I'm not cheating. We're going to have x squared times x minus 8 plus negative 1 times x plus negative 8 is minus 8. Now, x minus 8 is the GCF. And we're followed by the leftovers, x squared plus negative one, which is minus one. So we have x minus eight. And this is the difference of two squares. Let me try to make that not look like a D. 
because x squared is x squared and one squared is one. So this is the difference of two squares. So this factors into x plus one times x minus one. Now we're trying to find the zeros of the function. So, well, they'll make f of x equal zero. So we're going to solve this equation which means we take x minus 8 and set it equal to 0, x plus 1 and set it equal to 0, x minus 1 and set it equal to 0. So we will have x, add 8 to both sides, you'll have x equals 8. Subtract 1 from both sides, you'll have x equals one and add one to both sides, you'll get x equals one. So the zeros of the function are yeah, 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 are negative one, one, and eight. And notice that each one occurs once. Well, we've never had to keep track of that, but now we do. Multiplicity is how many times a number, a zero occurs. The multiplicity of each zero is one. And we will talk about this more tomorrow when I will talk to you all then. But stay around if you have questions.